It is my great honor to welcome Dr. Nicola Streeton from the UK. We're going to talk about her comics, women, women in comics scholarship. I'm so excited to have you here, Nicola. Thank you very much. It, it's an honor to be here with you. Nice to meet you. So we're going to talk right from the very start, like how you got into comics studies. Um, yeah, take us on your journey. Well, um, I, I had a place to do religious studies at, at university. And during my gap year, my year off, I spent a couple of months in Papua New Guinea in the Highlands, assisting a Polish-Australian PhD anthropologist uh, student looking into the influence of the mission. And it opened my eyes to how religion is actually part of uh, social anthropology. So I, I, stu I studied that. Um, and I was a fairly mediocre student. And afterwards, I, um, I, I taught English as a foreign language to students to make money. And, but I did think I'd like to be an artist. So uh, over the next few years, I traveled in South Asia and also then came back and uh, did a couple of very basic art foundation art courses. And then by the time I was 30, I had my first child. And um, I thought, actually, I, I'll focus on the teaching. I'll be a school teacher and enjoy motherhood and, and, and that sort of thing and have a steady income. But um, our, when Billy, our first child, my, my son was two, he died. And um, he was diagnosed 10 days before he died of uh, um, some congenital heart deformities. And of course, it turned our lives completely upside down. But one of the things uh, my, my now spouse is, a, a, is an artist, was an artist. And so our natural uh, response to grieving was to make artwork. And for me, it was right from the start, it was this cartoony style. And, um, and I thought, oh, yeah, I don't want be a teacher I want to draw and this was so this is a um, so I did and, and luckily some of my designs were put onto greeting cards and sold well and within a year I was a freelance illustrator and this is an example of one of, of a very early commission so this is the late 90s now and it, the irony is my child had died and most of the commissions I was getting were from things like baby magazine or weddings and it, so a lot of my work was about about parenting so um and then after 13 years um i this so to jumping to 2008 um i'd had a second child a daughter and um was was illustrating and and thought actually it's quite boring because the, the it was nice because you're always responding to a brief but i was never doing my own projects and so i signed up to an ma and thought actually I'd been introduced to the idea of the graphic novel. And so that's how I came into comics is the graphic novel path, not comics. I, I didn't not, wasn't really a fan of comics as a child or didn't know about comics. So, but the, I just thought there was a similarity in the illustration style I developed and I wanted to learn the language of a longer form. And I, and I signed up to a practical course, but actually the questions coming out were more interesting. So for example, why, why are you, from my fellow students, why are you doing a comic? What, what's the point of having pictures? And why are you doing a subject so depressing, like death and bereavement? And, and so I switched, and I switched my course to an academic one because I wanted to know the answers. And I was reading around autobiography and um, conscious that there weren't many women uh, com within comics history, and nor, many women graphic novelists so um, that got me on uh, alongside that I was also working away on my graphic novels so actually the two collided I finished my master of research and also had a publication in 2011 with Billy Me and You and then um, uh, and then it, it had whetted my appetite to return to academia I was a very mediocre undergraduate but as a postgraduate I with a lot of several decades under my belt I was much more infused by the whole ideas I was being reintroduced to in some cases so <clears throat> I took it to PhD looking at a, basically around a taxonomy of British women cartoonists and comics and um, that brings kind of brings us up to date yeah and of course um, we'll be talking about that 
uh, maybe some of the research that went into that and your your new scholarly work. But um, yeah, so you what is for you? What is the you mentioned comics weren't something that you had access to. It was really the graphic novel. Um, for you, what is what distinguishes these? Um, well, I guess um, what distinguishes the graphic novel is obviously it's a longer form comic. And I know when I began, you know, entered the very friendly community of, of comics, academics and makers in Britain, there was this debate about how the graphic novel was, you know, a terrible term and we should call it comic book. But actually, um, over the years, I've been thinking, no, it, it's graphic novel is important because it welcomes women makers and it welcomes women because memoir was something that was really uh, introduced and, and grown by the feminists, the feminist um, activists during the 70s and, and onwards. So now there's a very recognized and established uh, um, place position for women to, to write novels and for women in literature within the literary world. So I think it's a much easier segue for women uh, making graphic novels to enter that. And so it's actually a very different audience for my work and, and many of my contemporaries. It's not just the comics audience because that is actually very small and quite narrow. So this is for my book, which is about bereavement. Um, it has an audience within literature, you know, literary festival type things, but also it has uh, an audience of people who've been bereaved themselves. And so what happened um, when it was published is in the UK as well, it's, 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 a, it's very small what goes on. It's not, it, it's not really comparable with the USA. And so um, it made a big splash. And this is um, the national news did a feature on it because it was a serious subject matter, but it was done in comics form in the sort of light-hearted humorous association so um that that was a benefit for me but that's really in a sense in 2011 it was still quite new in the uk in fact you were the first really right to do the long-form graphic memoir um, in the uk well well the first british woman to have had a graphic memoir published yes okay and of course um it was uh you have this sort of lovely sort of image of of a kind of popular um, recognition, but you also it also won important awards. Um, so, you know, I love, by the way, this this uh, using and embracing graphic novel and memoir as a term because of its expansiveness, its inclusivity, and the way you kind of you know articulate and formulate yourself within that space and women in general um uh, and comics being you know the category itself being kind of held uh maybe straight jacketed and not not exactly the same so thank you for sharing that um well, well yeah. um i i think the criticism of within comic studies of the the use of the graphic novel is it elevates it it tries to make the comic not a humble throwaway form, but try to make it like high art in that sense within literature. But actually, I'm, so I'm just arguing, okay, that's true, but also it can be welcoming to people who, you know, may not be familiar with the comics. Um, Absolutely, yeah, no, I love that. Um, and um, I'm gonna borrow that, Nicholas. So. Great, 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 thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Take it. Um, <laughs> So yes, you talked about you know your work on kind of excavating a uh, a more accurate cultural history, and I know you focused on uh, British female women comics uh, from the 1970s, the 2010s. But yeah, maybe you can go into a little more about why this is important and why you know curating of exhibits and you know all of the things that you do around your be your sort of beautiful and poignant and strong uh, graphic memoir work, why all this other stuff is important? Well, um, it's, so I want to just contextualize um, the time after Billy Me and You came out and the time where I was studying still towards my PhD is 
there was, which I know um, Paul Gravette was a guest and one of the, it's probably one of the most exciting exhibitions that he co-curated was Comics Unmasked. And by the way, he is an absolute god for us within the comics community and he's certainly been um, a friend and supporter of everything I've done. And he, he's, he's a nice guy, as you know, and he, as, as well as a few others, greet people who are new and infuses us through his own enthusiasm. So um, this was very exciting. It was uh, 2014, it was the, at the British Library in London. It was an exhibition, a huge exhibition of comics art that hadn't been done before British, British art, hadn't been done before. It took two years to prepare, three curators, and it had more visitors than any other exhibition at the British Library ever. So it was for the comics community and comics worldwide, it was a great success. However, <laughs> um, it was somewhat problematic. And this is, where it, this is where the argument of why research and write about comics and women comes in, because it was a, it was a great show. Um, it, was, it was slightly, uh, imbalance, gender imbalance, but I didn't really digest that as a problem. It was curated by three men. The um, exhibition design was by Dave McKean, a man. Um, the poster was done by Jamie Hewlett, obviously also a man, and it was opened by Jonathan Ross. So, uh, and, uh, so all these are quite big names and have an association with comics, which helps bring the visitors. So I just have to clarify, I'm not saying, all men are bastards, I'm not, it's not about that and it's not a personal. It's about the system that needs to sell tickets and needing to sell tickets means a reliance on big names. And because of the history of comics, then the big names are, are, are often men. So that's, you know, it, that's fine. However, um, and I just, I mean, Jonathan Ross on the opening night said, um, yeah, yeah, there's even been a graphic memoir by Brian Talbot and some woman or something like that <laughs> that won the Costa Biography Awards in 2012. <laughs> so like, we're thinking, hang on a minute, his wife, Mary Talbot, is, you know, herself a distinguished feminist academic, and it was her who wrote it, and Brian was just the drawer. You know, it's this kind of thing, but, but that's how it, it happens, these small things. So in the foyer, uh, just this image on the, next to it was actually an image that was, uh, is by Angela, Car Angela Martin. It was the front cover of a series of comics, uh, the first one called Fanny which was edited by Kath Tate and Carol Bennett of Knockabout Comics Publishing. And so that was in the, in the 90s, early 90s. And, and that, and I, rem and I, you know, like I say, I'm friends, it's a friendly community. I said to one of the curators, how come you didn't commission Angela to do the poster? And he, and he said, well, the thing is, we it's the big name thing you know jamie hewlett is is well loved it's selling as a poster it's the best selling merchandise that comes out of the exhibition so and so there's a beautiful catalog full color catalog produced and and published and and again in the shop and the image in the, in it the images it has 87 images by men and eight by women and in the end index it's got 231 uh, na men's names and 37 women. So give or take, that was a rough count. So, okay, that's, um, so what that means is the documentation, you know, the exhibition comes and goes, the documentation stays. The d documentation, which didn't include all the exhibits in a, such a big exhibition, but the documentation is what people visit, revisit afterwards, and that's what gives the story and creates the history. So, a year later, 2016, two years later, another fantastic exhibition, beautiful comics creatrix of women, of women's um, comics artists worldwide. And again, Paul Gravette was one of the curators. It was a brilliant exhibition in a small gallery round the corner, a beautiful gallery, independent, without the budget to produce a catalog, that beautiful book that goes along with it. So they had some presence online, but again, you know, how, Reliable is an online presence. Perhaps it will be one day, but it can come and go. So again, uh, a great exhibition, slightly geographically round the corner, uh, slightly in that positioning, othering of women, uh, and, and there's no trace of it in that way that a documented book that stays in the archives brings. So in 2017, and I, I was not a 
co-curator of the Inking Woman, that was um, three or four women, including Kath Tate, who I mentioned again. And it was at the Cartoon Museum and it was uh, an exhibition of women artists brought together and, and all the time, I mean, Kath Tate was one of my um, case studies for my PhD, so I befriended her and all the time was discussing this. Every exhibition, it has to be documented, it has to be documented. So myriad um, editions came in afterwards, after the exhibition said, let's make a book of it. So it went beyond the exhibition. And again, it's the first history, illustrated history of its type of 250 years of women cartooning in Britain. And um, what the, the images on the on my left, and Mary Darley was actually the first caricaturist in Britain. The, so we think of Hogarth but, um, and men like him, but actually Darley was the first one in the 1700s, the late 1700s. And 100 years later, Mary Duval, which was a pseudonym for Isabelle Emmy de, de um, Tessier, actually was an uh, illustrator and theater um, uh, actress. And she drew the first cartoon character, which is Ali Sloper, now recognized. Um, first comic character because it was a recurring character and so recently but this was never really um, talked about and so actually um, Simon Grennan, Roger Sabin and Julian Waite uh, have produced this uh, wonderful Mary Duval online archive for everyone to see so again it's not about just women doing the work it's about people recognizing that this part of history it's now exciting to document it. Mm. Yeah, so fascinating. And thank you for sharing all of that. I hadn't, no of course, I know, but I didn't know the kind of background to those particular exhibits. But of course, it speaks to the trend in general, um, you know, of marginalizing and sidelining, you know, and, you know, this idea of the, the kind of big ticket. And you're, no, actually, you know, if you see and you take a chance and you actually put some money behind this, you're going to get a lot of people here and you're going to produce this beautiful book anyway. Mm. Um, well, I mean, but, but, it, but the point I'm making is it's not, it's not the men involved who are some kind of evil anti-women. They're doing their best, but it's the system. So yeah. uh, like yourself, it, it never had occurred to me and it still doesn't in every bit of life. And then someone points out and they go, oh, yeah. Oh. But, uh, but on the other hand, also interestingly with The Inking Woman, Kath Tate, who um, started a, a postcard company in the 80s, is now uh, has a, a, a very um, successful company making greetings cards. So she actually went to the Cartoon Museum, uh, Museum and said, this is an idea I've had for 20 years. I want to do it. And here's the money. So it's about, it's about building up and, and making things happen, I guess. Yeah, no, I completely relate in terms of the Latinx comics you know, and the kind of sidelining of our histories and, mm. and all of that here in the United States, um, not to mention, you know, women, of course, um, and then women of color. Um, but let's, I want to, I, I, I am so fascinated. Um, and I know, you know, this was, you know, coming out of a difficult place. It was your Billy, me and you was serialized and it was this, um, as you, as you had mentioned already, something that was, has been recognized in different venues. Can you tell us, can you share this creative journey with us? Yes, and, and I think this is also important because um, quite often, you know, we give talks and we say, oh, and then I published a graphic memoir and, it, <laughs> and I was on telly. You know, <laughs> people think, oh, it's easy and her style is quite rough. I could do that without the sort of backstory. So, um, uh, this was, I had a, Sally, my daughter, my, who my second child was about 12, and um, I'd been talking to her, I was doing this MA and talking to her about how uh, there was one comic when I was a child, heavily illustrated, Jackie, and about how it would be really nice if there was stuff for teenagers that was more fun, and, and she said, why don't we do a comic together? So um, that's how it started. It was a self-published comic, and... Um, I just have to say this picture of me on the horse is because um, we live in a village in rural England and uh, they have these things in rural England called um, 
produce shows. So it's where people bring the biggest marrow, the longest carrot and all this. And they have categories for knitted toys and so on. And one category was digitally enhanced photos. So I put this in and um, I didn't even get, there was only one other entry. They won. I didn't even get a post-it note saying good <laughs> attempt. And every year I, it was the same cat and I put in this like swapping the heads of my dog with me in various in the kitchen. And, and they just never, they kind of embarrassedly just ignored me. <laughs> so so um, I thought I'm going to carry on till I'm 80. And then they just stopped the category. <laughs> but anyway, so we thought, it was so funny for us as a family so we, oh great we can put it in licorice we can have that so we had recipes and a cartoon about our dog and this kind of thing but in the in just before and i sent it to print so it wasn't a it wasn't quite a zine it was slightly more but it was self-published and and i at the last moment put in us chapters of what became billy me new and it was uh, we had we set up a subscription uh, system with our friends and family and um and i gave them to people you know in the industry although i think i made corinne perlman take out a subscription she always says i can't believe you made me pay <laughs> as a publisher so she was creative um uh, creative uh, director at myriad editions and six months later she said oh come in we come in for a talk we'd really like to publish Billy Me News. So I went in and they said, you know, keep the day job. Uh, we can't, what we can't pay you in money, we can supplement with Prosecco. And I thought, yes, these are my people. So um, again, and then it was an intensive editing process that transformed what it had been in these little uh, zines into something uh, which I couldn't have done without Corinne. And, and she's a well-loved uh, person in the community here. And thank you to Myriad. So I've been with them since, really, as friends. And wow. Yeah, absolutely extraordinary and a gift for all of us. Um, and so one thing that I know others have talked about um, with your work, which is the kind of humor and trauma in the sort of same space or asking your readers to have the kind of both both emotions um, or experience um, both. So tell me, like, what is that to you? Yeah. Well, um, I, actually, I, I wanted to take this opportunity, if I may, to um, talk about the inspirations in my, what became my academic journey from looking at examples of trauma graphic novels, because when I started um, the PhD, the, these were the three books or women that I was responding to. First of all, um, Trina Robbins, who of course you're aware of, is the historian of women's works. And so, um, and also what I like about Trina is she's also coming as a creator. So she has these two hats on, historian and creator, and I like that idea. Um, and I, but again, it's these things we, uh, we don't question. I, I read her work and thought, oh, wow, yeah, women can't, oh, that's my history. And then you suddenly think, hang on a minute, I'm not American. What, what was going on? Why? So we were taking, we, I mean, I think I'm not alone, taking the history of American women's comics as our own. So, um, and, you know, that's just because she was, had been publishing, still is, and it's great. So that was one thing. And also Trina's aim in that is to produce a history, but her interest isn't in critical engagement. There's no theorizing. That's not her thing. And that's fine. So that's what I wanted to add to that conversation, the British angle and also the theory. Um, Hilary Shute, again, a most brilliant, brilliant book that has done so much for women uh, in comics. And um, again, it's looking at uh, five, six examples. Um, they're all American, except uh, Marjan Satrapi, who's, who's um, based in Iranian and based in France. So again, all works of trauma. So really important because it's a serious uh, theoretical uh, work look, which puts women's works on the mat, so to speak. Um, and what I wondered, really, my PhD was responding to Hilary Shute, because what I wondered was um, if that's basically the first substantial academic work about women's works, and it's all about 
autobiographical trauma, works of trauma, um, does that, there is the danger that then people say, oh, yes, you're a woman, so therefore you must be doing an autobiographical work about your own trauma. So there, I, this is, I mean, it's not what happens, this is what went through my mind that then it conflates with women can only do that. This is kind of very simplified. So, but what I was wondering about of, as that reinforces the idea of women as not being able to have a sense of humor, which is a stereotype I then looked at. So do you see where I was going with that? So I was thinking, so that's what I wanted to add to that conversation with, with Hillary. And then finally, Diane Atkinson, so it was to recognize what she'd done, but add to it. And Diane Atkinson, um, a British writer who produced a, an exhibition called Funny Girls Cartooning for Equality in 1997. And a lot of the work that she used was cartoonists, women cartoonists, a lot of them I looked at. Uh, but, and it went up to 1997. So again, it was like, okay, what happened in the decade or two since then? So that was, um, mm. that, those were the three, the three elements that sort of drove my questioning at the very start. Yeah, absolutely. I completely, um, I think that's so important to <laughs> kind yeah. of be careful with categories and how they can start to fix us, right? Um, and uh, so, but yeah, let's... And, I, and, and also, I think um, that's the thing about um, academia, that it took me quite a long time to really digest this. It's about a conversation. So it's about someone makes a word and then someone says, yeah, that's great what about this bit as well? So it's like, it's not a kind of competitive, you know, let's take them down. It's like, yes, let's build on that. And, that, and that, so that's for me, what I enjoyed about the process. Of Absolutely. And I think it also gets back to that, one of the comments you made earlier in our conversation about kind of, you know, this space as being a friendly space in the end. And we all actually, well, here I am talking with you and, yeah. you know, we, we talk to each other and we have, fun learning together and yeah. so um the theory what is your theory of feminist visual humor and this gets to your new your new book yeah, yeah so this um i'm going to try and be brief and i hope it's clear i've got notes so um i just wanted uh, on my book cover i put the reference to the light bulb which is a reference to the very famous 1970s light bulb joke of um, <clears throat> how many feminists does it take to change a light bulb and the answer is that's not funny so um, in my again part of my thinking and the joy of the PhD was hang on what there's still this idea that women don't have a sense of humor what's going on there why is there that stereotype because really again it's like in my experience I get together with a few of my women friends and we're wetting ourselves with laughter within minutes and, you know, even before we've had a drink. So it's that idea that the women I meet, especially the feminists, are often really funny. So, um, so um, I was in my journey, I was most inspired by um, Sarah Ahmed, who I think there might be a next slide. Let's see if it takes us on. So um, she wrote The Promise of ha Happiness. She's a fantastic, uh, inspiring scholar. Um, and she again asks why the feminists kill joy and um, she has a theory which I'll develop so it's this idea it's all bound in with this idea of what happiness is and that the feminist is a, the kill joy is destroying this idea of happiness so I'll tell you I'll come back to what she um, talks about later because it's more up to date but if you go to the next slide I found um, that I was Googling, uh, again, just to go back to the inking woman is for a general reader. And so we included a look at the suffragette work uh, cartoons. But if you Google suffragette cartoons, what comes up is pages and pages of anti-suffrage cartoons. And um, so these are just plucked examples, but what they're showing, basically the message that went out and it went out on postcards all over, you know, the Royal Mail was very busy and it, this was a great platform. And, and feminism, early feminism was deeply threatening, deeply unpopular. And so what the message was is these feminists, they're only feminists because they're too ugly 
to get a, a man, to get a husband. So it's this visual depiction of um, the, the women who are, you know, this ugliness is also part of that depiction, that visual de depiction is humorless. They're all frowning, they're all downturned mouths and they're all grumpy. So um, on to the next one. Um, so then, um, and then Sarah Ahmed talks about also the envious, happy, um, she looks at these, this, this is 2005, she, she references this proliferation of house, happy housewife blogs. And she cites one, um, Darla Shine's Happy Housewives, that proclaims women who don't share her route to happiness should just grow up, shut up, and count your blessings. So it brings this idea back to the, you know, from the suffragettes, it's still going on, even in the 2000s, that if a woman isn't happy, if she's a feminist questioning that, it's only because she's too, not only too ugly to get a husband, but she's jealous. And so it's this idea of envy. So it's because the route to happiness is to have a lovely house and be a housewife and have children and all this. And if you, if you haven't got that, then uh, then you're you're just envious. So it's nothing to do, like with the suffrage, anti-suffrage, nothing to do with actually questioning a bigger picture. So by by making it envy rather than anger, it's um, Sean Guy uh, talks about how anger is a grander passion, but actually um, envy is not one of the grand one of the grand passions. So again, it's making it slightly slightly um, less powerful. But um, again, um, the angry, fe the persistent stereotype of the humorless, angry femi feminist, but also anger was added. So, um, so um, if it's added to a stereotype, so the, the feminists now in the modern day become branded as ugly and angry, and both are implied visually through a humorlessness. And the consequence of this image is more harmful to feminism than one that's just pure anger, which isn't adulterated by this, uh, this ingredient of envy. Mm. So um, it's this invasive and powerfully reinforcement of this uh, visually and through humor of the feminist that has enabled this stereotype to be sustained. So then I think I put some examples of how this is done. This is in the 70s. And again, we can see the angry feminist of, um, depicted of, as humorless. So she can't take a joke. And so she says, what did you criticize Harry's soup of the day or the women's rights bill? So uh, in Britain, uh, the women's liberation movement was very active in the early 70s. And so this was a direct, uh, you know, mm -hmm. joke. But, and then the next one, a couple of... So feminists became too angry, too ugly. But so what? And I think this takes us to the question um, of the power of humour. So why do we care? What, what does it matter if feminists are considered humorous? And then if you think about the power of humour and then, um, you know, if we think about things like the aphrodisiac qualities of humour, the, um, the, the jokes in, in the House of in houses of parliament, in, in, in um, you know, barristers, all these very powerful people in society use humor. And my examples are um, a comedian is Ukraine's president. And then if we look at our own in Britain, our own prime minister, he's, he's loved, you know, I think he, his, his power is through his humor. He was on telly as a, as a comedian, for goodness, you know, as a, as, as a humorist. That's how I know him, although he had a political career. And that's the kind of charisma that he relies on. So if you're not allowed, if you're told you're humorless and you're not allowed because you, your humor doesn't fit into one form of what's funny, if you don't laugh down at people, then um, your, your weapon is taken away. So Umberto Eco talked about the um, humor as a weapon and it's like when it's turned around so the less powerful laugh up at the, uh, the people in power that's when you can gain the power so um, if you click I wonder 
That's Umberto work. So if we say women are not funny, they can't use that weapon. So they're de-weaponized. And so then how do we, what do we do next? Um, and that's the, the solution that, and that's what became the heart of my PhD is to gain power is, and you see, it, and I saw it through my research is forming a group, your own group who laughs at your jokes. And visually this include comics and cartoons and all the cartoons and comics by women in the UK that I found all started from feminist publications. So mm. from the seventies spare rib. And then if you look at Trina Robbins, you know, she wasn't, she openly says she wasn't welcomed in the alternative comics world because it was very masculine, even in the seventies, it was in voice, you know, played tribute to feminism, but her illustration, her early illustration work was for feminist periodicals. So it's again, it's about um, the putting the structures in place it's if you trace it back you can see that it's feminist work that has produced those and again with publishing that included cartoon books in the in the late 70s and 80s yeah, and continues today so that's my journey i hope it made some sort of sense and then <laughs> if we look back to the suffragettes we can see this same idea you know you talked about this friendship this gathering together of women um making art and visualizing the answer to this anti-suffrage uh, humor. And again, they're not, they're not creating a butt of the joke. They, they are um, attacking or they are satirizing the system. So it's about this bigger picture. It's not, it's not a, a butt of the joke type of humor. But again, it's, and again, it was, um, oh yeah, here are some later. What makes you think you would be a good butt for our sexist jokes? So this is Griselda in the 70s. And uh, Rihanna Duncan, who, I mean, there have been women who appear, whose work is in The Inking Woman, who have steadfastly had a, a solid, uh, successful career as cartoonists. That's an excellent suggestion, Miss Triggs. Perhaps one of the men here would like to make it. So it's these um, quietly carrying on. And then this is Jackie Fre Fleming. We've agreed to move the magazines which are degrading to women out of the reach of small children. Great. Any idea how old he should be for images degrading to women? Eight, 11, 15, 25? <laughs> so great cartoons. Yeah, there's something about laughter um, and of course the humor that allows for laughter um, that can and does if it's coming from the right place, open, again, open spaces for us to breathe, right? Yeah. Totally, totally. And so I think I, I put, came to my, I think there's, if you click, yeah. So it's, it's how then do I say, do I argue that this feminist movement or this feminist platforms allowing cartoons and humor by women, why is it activism? And it's exactly that it creates recognition in, in stories or situations or experiences that may not be otherwise uh, recognized. It reinforces a group value. So if an audience gets the jokes gradually as the audience grows, that shapes what we think of as funny. And we only have to look back to the 70s. I mean, I've, in this lockdown, I've been watching films that I thought were absolutely hilarious. <laughs> 20 years ago, I'm watching them with my daughter and she's, She's saying, really? You thought that was funny? And I was thinking, and I'm like, yeah, how? How did I? So, huh. you know, it, it's not innate. That's what that proves that you, it's not an innate thing that you're born with to laugh or, you know, to understand humor or have humor. It's so socially created mm -hmm. and culturally, and it's shocking what we thought was funny. Thought provoking again. So, again, it's every time that humor is just another way. And again, it's, you know, there's lots of, um, feminism and there's lots of media that's grown and looking at the comics is just a, a one other form of where fem feminism can be shown working successfully really. So yeah I mean in a way you've kind of been doing this all along in our conversation but was there have there been any surprises for you in the bringing of your creative and your scholarly work together? Um, I, I think so I think it's um, Ah, it's surprise and it's also, it's also a slight, um, I, I, I don't know, I don't, I, 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 well, it's like, it's when you start and you think, oh, you know, you're at the beginning of your journey, oh, I know nothing, and you kind of go, I don't know if everyone's the same, but you go through 
you know, I still know nothing, you know, that feeling where, and, and, and it's this, but it's a growing and I'm with more confidence. It's this idea of friendship and it's this idea. Um, I remember when I started my M my MRES, I was um, introduced to research methodology, to Marxism, to existentialism, to all these isms. And I was saying, well, so can I use feminism? Oh, well, only if you combine it with another one, you know, like another male <laughs> invented ism. And it was this, it's not really, it, there's always this fear that it's going to be wishy-washy. And so, uh, but I actually, with more confidence, I, I say friendship as methodology is absolutely where mm. it's at. And, and perhaps in the 80s, we invented this idea of networking and it became corporate. But actually, all that is, is making friends, but it may not have caught on. So that was, um, that was uh, one of my things. And also this idea which is, again, it's really difficult to get away from this because we live, uh, we live entrenched in, in Western capitalism and neoliberalism in this discourse of the individual, don't we? And um, actually, you don't get anywhere doing stuff on your own. You have to do it. <laughs> you, you, like, if you can do something on your own, think how much bigger and better and stronger you can do it if you're working with people. So it's this idea of community. And actually, I think COVID has really uh, reminding us of this in an unlikely way that it's saying, you know, yeah, go out and help your neighbor and make sure they're getting food and they're not too lonely. So it's really challenging this idea because who wants to be stuck all alone? It's no fun. And it's again, it's about this idea that oh academia has to be has to be boring it has to be serious well why who said that <laughs> you know and let's challenge it as long as you're a provoking thought and innovation and new ideas then why not have fun and do it together with a group of people that you like and you laugh at similar jokes so that's um but again it's it's so so and then this was about um i 2008 I co-founded with Sarah Lightman an artist and also academics in a similar position to me something we called ladies do comics which has now become LDC mm -hmm. and um, part of that was the isolation of working alone and find feeling like there must be of a, a community out there of people the same as us and so over a decade later it's still going and we do have our community and it's enabled me in the way that being an academic gives you a passport to kind of get in touch with people. It also, um, being a creator and an academic meant I had access to lots of um, women, both historical and current to say, can I, may I interview you, that kind of thing. I see your LDC and your back on your wall there. I love Yep, it. yep, yep, subtle. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I also love this friendship as methodology. Mm. You do so much. You do other, uh, other. You work in other spaces too. This um, poverty, um, migrating out of poverty program, um, as yeah. a different kind of a project. Why, why take something like this on? Well, um, this was. It, it's. I mean, this slide is. It's 2016, so it's some time ago. But it was about really. It's to show how comics can be used so successfully beyond comics, beyond. A comic for entertainment and this was a research project by academics funded by um, the UK Department for International Development looking at um, ways out of poverty and looking at this uh, economic migration between Cambodia and Thailand and they they called me in I had a, f a friend working on it who said oh don't you think it would be br we've got all the transcripts we've got all the reports we've got you know photo references wouldn't it be great to do a comic will you draw it and so I did it it was a it was a job you know it's a, a job but what's exciting and, and I'm grateful for you to including it and in, is because it does show how that comic has been translated into Thai and Khmer and it's just circulated everyone it spurred workshops and talks you know conversations and it informs, it just informs serious research and gets results with a very light touch because it is a comic and we all love comics. And that's what's so brilliant about this sort of, you know, the low form, the, the, our associations. Yeah. You know, it's funny. We had a um, symposium here a couple of months ago and someone was 
getting upset about the fact that you know we that we were still writing in the colonizer's tongue in comics and i said well hold on we have to remind ourselves that there's a sort of third language here that's even more important which is the visuals right mm -hmm. you know let's not totally like get too like preoccupied with whether it's written in english or spanish etc yeah. and think about how actually the visuals um are you know, showing and telling the story for us. Um, yeah. LDC, mm -hmm. my goodness, you just talked about that. And um, this, I, gosh, I love this. So comics festival, you know, tell me, tell us, tell the world about this. <laughs> well, it's, um, you know, we start in 2008 to, as a forum. So we ran monthly and invited, not just women, it's women led, but not women only. So we were inviting um, work, people who were better than us was our kind of guideline. And they didn't have to be comics makers, they could be academics or film makers or novelists, but some link to the comics form. And it was really, really fun. And we served cake and welcomed everyone and, and it carried on. And then in 2018, after much kind of thinking, no, I don't really want us to go down that line, we decided to apply for public funding. And so, um, this funded our first festival and it's not, I mean, there are some amazing festivals in Britain. There's two very big ones. Thought Bubble is the main one and a, quite a traditional part of festivals, which I guess is in America too, is this idea of a marketplace. And I, I wanted our festival to be slightly different to that. So um, we combined it with a prize that was a cash prize, women only. So we went out for the, okay, let's do something women only. And um, everyone who entered the prize has their work displayed as a booklet. They have to public, they have to print their own zine version of 12 pages that they submit. And during the festival, we can display that. So it's everyone's a winner. It's not just like six shortlisted and the winner who go off with a trophy and a, a bit of cash. It's everyone. And then because of it's the nature of the um zines we can put them in a case and tour it so we last year toured it to derby up uh, an area of the uk to the libraries and ran workshops and this year we're invited and hopefully we'll be at the helsinki comics festival so again we're taking it's a snapshot of what women are doing in the uk and there's a, an amazing variety of uh, styles and stories and so on and then um, as part, because we were, it's Arts Council funding, part of our package was developing um, professional development activity throughout the year. So this on the right is actually, this is my home. So I, it's in the other room, but this is, I hosted, we hosted our first residency last year and it's been knocked back to the winter now, but that was for eight people. And it was just a ball. It was women only again. And, and we kind of cooked nice food and went for walks and, everyone and did workshops and and so that's one of the things and now we're doing online mentoring with women mentors but open to everybody so that's one of the activities but our on well when we get to that what are you doing now <laughs> so our vision our long-term vision is to find a home for ourselves so that's mm -hmm. what we're working towards to have to build a home for our community that goes beyond uh, it's not an exhibition space it's a place where people it's residency based but it also has a garden and a, it also has an orchard and people can cook together so it's kind of we I think again this lockdown is like you were saying in earlier it's really making us think about our priorities and and what we want and it's not just making comics and getting them published in isolation and then you know <laughs> going off as a millionaire it's not about that it's about spending time around it and how do you get feedback because and how do you have a nice time and feel enriched and it's about bringing people in um who've never drawn before or who are curious about the form and so i think that you know the power the the power the, the contribution to health and well-being that uh, creative activity whatever it might be can bring is immense and that's what we're a committee of six and we're all committed we're all creators at, at LDC and, and we all have this firm belief in the power of the creative process and so that might be dancing around 
and then you know having a cocktail whatever it is but we're using comics as the center and spiraling out and i think that's no i totally get it and in fact you're this sort of you just this is this is how mentoring and wellness um, mm. and, mm. and growth and intellectual growth and creative growth mm. i was thinking when you were talking about um this coming fall will be the sixth year that i've done this it's my Sulcon, the Brown, Black, and Indigenous Comics Festival. And, um, and I bring, I bus in kids. One thing here in Columbus, Ohio, is that uh, we have a growing Latinx, Latino population, and we have a historically very um, established African-American population, but both are on the margins of the city. Um, physically and also resource wise and I thought we never have opportunities to bring these kids together and so Solcon every fall I bust in all these kiddos and we have these amazing artists as mentors running workshops and the joy of these kids in the workshops and also learning and meeting the creators of these mm. comics is exactly what you were talking about. Mm. Mm. And it extends to adults as well. It's not just kids. It's that yeah. we all need it. But, um, well, let's do something together internationally when we have our, <laughs> our community home. Because I think it's about that, isn't it? It's this yes. sort of, Absolutely. Uh, what, can we, what can we offer? What can we, you know, come and bring your festival to the UK. Is, is Absolutely. On it. I'm amazing. ready. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, what is, tell me, uh, I, maybe this speaks to some of the things you were just talking about. Mm. Oh, yeah, so that's, um, and then, um, what do you work currently with? I don't know, I put some little, um, these two on either, oh, no, go back. Um, so I, oh, no, forward. <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's somewhere in there, but yeah, what are okay. you working on? I put some little, um, oh, what I'm, no, go back, go forward, go, yeah, stop, stop. So um, I, again, um, oh, it's jumping. Maybe I'd put it on a time. So I'm, start, I'm launching um, Dr. Nicola 2020. Uh, I'm, I just received this week, uh, the Arts Council England has um, launched an emergency funding for creators. And so um, I'm very grateful to have been, to be supported in this. And it's going to be, 20 hours 20th of each month so eight o'clock uk time and it's um having guests uh so it's ref it's reflecting on my uh academic books my case studies so hopefully the idea is during the lockdown until october i'll be running monthly um conversations with the women that i worked with for my research so it's very uh uk based mm. uh, so it's it's um my case studies including and I, I hope they'll be able to join me is um, some of the women who were part of the 1970 uh, Miss World protest mm -hmm. and uh, what the, one of the most exciting things in my research was they produced this pamphlet at the time to distribute and to give out and it was it has comics in it I mean cartoons so that's and it's very funny so that's people like that I want to get hopefully will join me um, online. So that's my, my thing. And then I'm also uh, cartooning myself again this time. It's a hard time, but it's quite nice for creators to, you know, um, when I teach in London, it's a six hour round commute. And so this is lovely. I know it's not great to be teaching online, but actually, it's quite nice not to do that journey for a while, for now. So, that's yeah, there's the, there are the silver linings. I totally understand. Yeah, yeah, silver lining. And we have to we have to look and reach for those. Um, yeah. So these are this is a collection of um, some interest. There's there's so much happening in the UK, and I've focused on what I know in the UK. So, um, Kate Charlesworth, who last year published Sensible Footwear, and Kate Charlesworth is. She's kind of like the British uh, um, Alison Bechdel, in a sense. She had a strip in the 80s about uh, living as a lesbian and reflecting the lesbian gay community. 
and but and also was working as an illustrator and graphic designer. She's now done this wonderful memoir that puts her own uh, autobiographical story within the context of uh, what was happening within lesbian LGBTQ rights or LGBT as it was. And so that's um, that's fascinating because it's a social uh, documentation as well as her personal and it, a, a brilliant, brilliant book. And it's nice that she's a older generation comics artist and this is her swan song really it's her greatest work barking is a is a new work by lucy sullivan just out and it's it's exceptional uh, the drawing pulls you in it's an emotional roller coaster about uh mental health and um and bereavement and it, it's just it's great because it it, uh, when I look at it, I open it, I think, yes, you're challenging what a comic can do, you know, and I think that's always exciting to me. And again, she comes from a illustration animation background. Stephen Appleby is an old generation um, cartoonist, uh, has been doing brilliant uh, cartooning for decades. And Dragman, again, is a very exciting work about... Um, uh, it's a it's a fiction and fantasy, but around quite uh, now important issues around uh, transgender. So that's an exciting work. And, and Simone Lear, who's a, another a brilliant cartoonist and graphic novelist, has a weekly strip in The Observer at the moment. Danny Noble is one to watch out for. Shame Pudding is coming out uh, any minute now. And, and her, her style is just really charming and wonderful and I think this one is we're all on tenterhooks to see uh, what she'll bring us and Sabah Khan is is working on a project for next year and again it's interesting because it's engaging with ideas around what it means to be British with um, Pakistani family heritage and where she's positioning herself as a woman um, and her story of that and then two works from America that are anthologies, one edited by uh, M.K. Sowiak, who's also comic nurse. She draws as, under that uh, name. And she's collected uh, cartoons around menopause, which is great. And Drawing Power, I don't know if you've heard of this, Diane Newman, again created, uh, pulled together, this came out last year, 2019, around um, women's stories of sexual violence. So. Uh, mostly American, but I'm delighted and proud to say I've got contributions in both of those. So that's good. And they're important books. And I think it's, it's again, they're reflecting women coming together and, and drawing works. And then on the right, I put, um, as well as LDC, Myriad is my publisher and they run a first graphic novel competition. So whereas we offer cash and mentoring, they're offering a publishing deal as to the winner and and broken frontier i've put there because um really it's it's led it's uh andy oliver uh, is not a woman it's not women led but uh andy oliver is a real ambassador for what's happening uh in independent comics and and always he's everywhere and never sleeps and is always supportive so i think those kind of uh people and uh, drivers of the community are really important and their allies you know in this endeavor beautiful gosh yeah there's some here that i recognize and that i've read and then there's some that i'm so excited to order up and unfortunately our library is closed but um where i get most of my comics but it just means that we're gonna i'll be supporting the artist directly here so um yeah. So gosh, Nicola, oh man, I, this is like the embodiment of kind of friendship as methodology, right? Your concept. <laughs> and um, I want to thank you for taking the time to share your journey. It's been remarkable for me. I know it will be for others listening and watching. Thank you very much for having me and asking your questions. Let's keep in touch. Absolutely, yes.